Grace and peace be to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. You know, I've always been intrigued by what kind of person it takes to take the job as a professional sporting referee. You know, any job where people have to apply the rules to active sports really is just a totally thankless job. I mean, when you think about it, who gets yelled at more on a baseball field? The pitcher who throws a, a ball just two inches outside of the strike zone or the umpire that calls it ball four to, to win the game for the other team. Now, these guys and gals, they, they constantly get second guessed, they get called names, they get yelled at, they get cursed at by the people up in the top row that they're not strong enough to throw a ball at, and, and they're in just as much physical danger as anybody else in the sport that they're involved in. I mean, I've seen baseball umpires get hit by errant pitches. I've seen uh, football referees get trucked as a wide receiver is cutting across the field to make a catch. I've even seen boxing referees that are trying to make a clean break as the two fighters are against the ropes get popped with a right cross and go flat as a stack of pancakes. Now, oftentimes, these are the people in the middle of danger being tasked with delivering disappointing messages to an extremely unkind audience because the decisions that they make are undoubtedly going to either anger one team or the other. Who would willingly take a job like that? You'd have to be slightly out of your mind. I mean, who has the guts to not only deliver a message that people don't want to hear, but to deliver it with authority, unapologetically, sometimes while the manager of the other team is kicking dirt on you as hard as he can? When I was looking at this message over the past week, I read backwards a little bit in the book of Jeremiah, and I found in chapter 25 the message that he was delivering to the people when he was in the temple. God said, Take this cup of the wine of wrath from my hand and cause all the nations to whom I send you to drink it. They will drink and stagger and go mad because of the sword that I will send among them. Now this is also the argument that's often used for not selling beer after the seventh inning stretch. <clears throat> But what was the cup that Jerusalem was to drink? Specifically, this was the cup of their very destruction. This was the cup of the Lord's wrath. Now, we hear in our reading today uh, a reference to Shiloh. In earlier days, Shiloh had been completely destroyed. Now, this town was the original home of of the Ark of the Covenant and the Tabernacle. This was where the Lord dwelled amongst his people. But the trouble is, the people of Shiloh became complacent in their relationship with God. And so, when those big nasty Philistines came in trying to take over, they went to battle and they were extremely confident because they were the chosen people of God. They had the Ark of the Tabernacle. They had the presence of God with them. And they marched out to battle and just like every Cleveland sports team, they got routed. They got trounced. And so they went back to the city and they said, well, if we bring the Ark of the Covenant with us, they will surely be afraid. And they brought the Ark of the Covenant out to battle, but they kind of forgot to bring God with it. And so it didn't help a whole lot. And the Philistines swept the series, and they took the Ark of the Covenant home like their own World Series trophy. See, the people lost the idea that faithfulness to God is more important than, than the icons of faithfulness. Well, moving on into the uh, 26th chapter of Jeremiah, Jeremiah is standing in the temple and he's delivering this message about the possible destruction of Jerusalem because of their lack of faithfulness in their relationship with God. And he spoke this word of warning to Israel every single word of it. He did not sugarcoat. He did not make it sound nice. He told them exactly what God had to say. This is a smart thing to do when God asks you to pass a message. And when he was called to speak this difficult message, he was called to speak it with authority as if it was delivered straight out of God's mouth, although the people wouldn't want to hear it. But even still, Jeremiah presented this threatening word of God with a bit of hope. If the people repented, 
God would relent from the calamity that he had planned against Jerusalem. Now, if God had threatened to wipe your very existence off the face of the earth, but if you repent, he would decide not to do that, you would think that you would be covering yourself with as much, as much dust and ashes and sackcloth as you could find. But rather than repenting, Jerusalem was angry and wanted to kill Jeremiah. They wanted him dead for prophesying against the city of Jerusalem and the people of God because, guys, we have the temple of God in our city. He chose us. We're his people. And this one guy is going to tell us that we're messing up. I don't like what you're saying, and I think that we're going to kill you now. What the people of Jerusalem missed was this was the same attitude as the people of Shiloh, thinking that they had the Ark of the Covenant and therefore they were above reproach. It doesn't work that way. Jeremiah disregarded the danger that he knew would accompany his message, and he gave himself fully to the mission of delivering that message. When I say he gave himself fully to this mission, pardon me, <clears throat> it's been a long day. When, when I say he gave himself fully to this mission, I don't just mean that he delivered this message with gusto. I mean he gave himself to the mission of delivering the message. What he says to the people when they threaten to kill him, <clears throat> God sent me to tell you this against you. If you repent and obey, he will relent. And here's the quote, but as for me, behold, I am in your hands. Do with me as is good and right in your sight. Only know if you put me to death, you bring innocent blood on yourselves, on your city, and on all of its inhabitants, for truly the Lord has sent me to tell you all this. How gutsy is that? Jeremiah delivered this message to the people with no regard for himself. He delivered it straight into their faces, and when his mission was over, he said, do with me as you please. My job is done. I have done as God has called me to do. Jesus also carried a message from God in his day that definitely angered the people that listened to him. When he was traveling to Jerusalem from his previous stop, Herod sent some Pharisees, of all the people to send a message to Jesus with, he sent the Pharisees to let Jesus know, you should probably get out of here because Herod wants you dead. And Jesus hearing this message, responded in a very interesting way from a reading from Luke. He said to them, go and tell that fox, behold, I cast out demons and perform cures today and tomorrow, and the third day I finish my course. Nevertheless, I must go on my way today, tomorrow, and the day following, for it cannot be that a prophet should perish away from Jerusalem. Boy, oh boy. The, the two interesting points here. First, Christ says, Behold, I cast out demons and do cures. This is, this is what the prophets do. The prophets, they go and free those who are under the burden of sin with God's word. They go and do hard things. They proclaim light into the darkness, even if it means danger to them. Set that against what Herod is doing. Everything in his power, little though it may be, to prevent the message of God from being spread. Jesus wants Herod to know that he is indeed a prophet and that his mercy, his mission, outweighs the malice of Herod. What I have to do, my mission from God, is more important to me than the danger that you're saying I'm in. Regardless of the very real threats from Herod, Jesus moves on in his mission. The second point of interest here is when Jesus says, it is simply not possible for a prophet to be destroyed outside of Jerusalem. Jesus is being snarky here. He's being a smart aleck. That's what Jesus is doing. This is satire. This is Monty Python stuff, not, not the Holy Grail. This is, this is him teasing about the bloody history of Jerusalem. This is like Jesus hearing that Herod wants to kill him knowing how many of the prophets have been stoned to death in Jerusalem, and Jesus saying, oh, wait, Herod wants to kill me? No way. I never would have seen that one coming, <clears throat> omniscient. But far be it from me 
to die somewhere other than Jerusalem. I, I, I wouldn't want to die outside of the great Herod's will. Just, just let Herod know that it's some other town's turn to kill someone sent from a message of God for once that, that he doesn't like. He's just going to have to share his toys like a good little Herod, or he's not going to get dessert tonight. Someone threatened Jesus' life and he laughed it off. Does that mean that Jesus is ignoring the fact that, that he's being threatened with death? No. Jesus knows that his mission ends in death. And he's still marching toward the end of that mission with his eyes set on the end. What it means is that what Herod is doing is not as important as finishing out his mission. Look at the boldness of Christ. He's scoffing at these very real threats to end his life, but he's despising safety for the sake of the mission and eventually the cross. Despising doesn't mean what we think it means, folks. It doesn't mean hating. Everyone thinks that despising means hating something. It means considering one thing of less importance than another. He is despising his safety in exchange for his mission and the cross of our salvation. He's insisting on delivering this message in the face of peril, in the face of certain death that he already knows he is going to suffer. This is an in-your-face kind of message to the people and to the powers that be. This is important to us today. This is important to us right now. In the book of Philippians, our reading from today, for many walk of whom I have often told you and now tell you, even weeping, that they are enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their appetite, and whose glory is in their shame, who set their minds on earthly things. The heart of Christ is absolutely broken for those who do not and will not see him as their Savior. And the impenitence of Jerusalem just like the impenitence of the rest of the world continues to this day. Christ's heartbreak can be felt. It's palpable in our reading from the book of Luke. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together just as a hen gathers her brood under her wings and you wouldn't have it. Think of the mother calling her prodigal back home. You're safe here. Come back to me. I love you and I want to help you. No, mom. This isn't your job. This isn't your life. I'll do it my way. Think of the heartbreak. This is Christ's heartbreak for the lost. The time for every human being and the time for this world is drawing short. The time for us to make a change is now. But the Lord still reaches out to his wayward children, earnestly seeking to gather them under his protective wing because of his love. He reaches out to us in mercy despite the indifference or outright hatred that some of the receivers of his message will have for him. That same message, that same mission that Christ took so seriously, that is our mission today. Christ steeled, steeled himself and set his eyes on the completion of his mission, no matter what the cost. And he set his will to die so that you, his beloved creation, might live. Without his gospel, without the good news that Jesus saves those who believe in him from, to be saved from their sins, people will die as enemies of God. <clears throat> Yet today's emphasis on tolerance and political correctness is enough to take the truth right out of our mouths. It's enough to make us cower and not to tell the truth and not to give that love of God, that message of salvation. You can't preach on this kind of a thing. You'll offend the congregation. We can't say Jesus is the only way. That's intolerant. We can't say that if you don't have saving faith in Jesus as your Savior, that you're bound for hell. We can't say that. That's hateful. Now let's water it down and make it acceptable. Let's, 
Let's not talk about the unmentionable sins that make us uncomfortable. Let's just have a, a private, quiet faith that's sure not to hurt anybody's feelings. Anything, but please don't call me intolerant or closed-minded or that buzzword of the day, a bigot. Don't call me that. We who call upon the name of Jesus Christ as the only way to salvation, the light given to the Gentiles, we do see him because we call upon him. We say, blessed is the name who comes, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We see through his humiliation. We see through the oppression of Herod. We see through the rejection of his own people. And we see right to the foot of the cross. And now... We that have seen the truth of the Son of God who revealed in himself the love that the Father has for all of his creation. We are blessed to bring the truth to those who have not yet seen his love and his compassion. To those who are trapped in the darkness of sin, who believe in no forgiveness, no compassion, no love, only emptiness, imprisonment, and damnation. We are blessed to bring the good news of a Savior who, while we are trapped in darkness, opens the door and lets in the light. This is a mission that is worth living for, worth risking for, and worth dying for. Jesus knew it would be unpopular. He knew it would be difficult, and he knew it would be dangerous. He said, anyone who wishes to follow me needs to deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Prophets aren't killed only in Jerusalem. They're killed in the hearts of non-believers every single day. But now the slaves have been sent and killed, just like in the, the parable of the evil vineyard keepers and the vineyard owner. They've been sent and killed. The owner of the vineyard has sent his son. And the son knows that he brings a message that isn't easy to swallow, that he's the only way to make peace with the father. But he's willing. Is God's truth, his light, his saving grace so alive in your life that you're willing to risk your comfort and your safety to pass that beautiful light to someone that might reject you, to a loved one, to a stranger, to an enemy? Because... Jesus died to send the message to you while you were still his enemy. For the sake of the world, it is time to let go of political correctness. It is time to let go of tolerance. And it is time to have an in-your-face kind of faith because time is drawing short. Thanks be to God. He loves you so much that he delivered his gospel in the face of an unbelieving world and gave his life for you even then. Let your love of God's creation mirror his in that your mission is of such importance that you scoff at the threats of the enemy. The salvation of your brothers and sisters is the one thing worth dying for. Because the message that you're bringing to the people is the only thing that can guarantee that even if they decide to kill the messenger, the messenger is going to be raised again on the last day. So go forth today, empowered and emboldened to speak the truth in love, to set aside political correctness, to set aside pride and the need to be considered what the world wants today. Let's be what Jesus wants today. Let's be what the world needs today. Be bold. Be in your face about your faith. Let's fix our eyes on Jesus. Let the love of God shine through us, preaching the truth in love, regarding the mission as greater than the danger. In Jesus' name, amen.